Hello there and greetings. It's Business Life 360 After Hours. I'm your host, Christy Kay, and this is the podcast where we take that deep breath and that deeper dive into the real lives, experiences, and perspectives of success-driven people. We are going to tackle real-life topics at the intersection of business and life. After the workday, when we're theoretically off the clock, that's when After Hours picks up. Because that's when the convergence of life moments and the workday truly shows up. It is, after all, After Hours. Our topic on this Business Life 360 After Hours episode is moving beyond toxic relationships. This podcast episode is for anyone at any age who has experienced unhealthy, toxic relationships to understand why these persist and how to move beyond them to feel healthy again. My guest today is Dr. Caroline Leaf a communication pathologist and cognitive neuroscientist who studied at the universities of Cape Town and Pretoria in South Africa. She has also spent four decades researching, speaking on, writing, best-selling books on topics tied to the mind-brain connection. Her topics are plentiful and fascinating. So unfortunately on this podcast, I have to whittle it down and take our conversation a little bit slimmer to fit the time frame. So here we go, Dr. Leaf, it is a true pleasure to have you here on Business Life After Hours. Thank you so much, Christy. It's lovely to talk again. We had such a great conversation before. Here it is. There's bumpy relationships, which are somewhat normal. You know, you can work through them and there are differences and then you can kind of move on. But then there are what I will call toxic people or toxic relationships. And those are the ones where these people can manipulate you. They make you feel kind of like a piece of dirt. They can suck the joy out of you. And for whatever reason, there's always one. Why is that? There's always one at the office, in a social circle, a parent at your kid's organization or school. Why is that? I think it's just a lot of it relates to a person's self-confidence or, you know, if you've said self-confidence, let's talk about a person's identity. If a person understands their global self-worth, they are much easier to be around than someone who doesn't. So someone who's feeling challenged tend to be the ones that feel sort of challenged in that area. They tend to be the ones that are the most prickly and they see something in you that makes them feel bad about themselves. So it's easier for them to maybe gossip or be unkind or say things that make you feel bad. And, you know, there's so much communication, 50% of communication is nonverbal. So we are sending through all these little body body language type things in a nonverbal way. And so someone might be smiling at you at the office or smiling at you at your you know, friend group or whatever, but you know deep down inside that there's something wrong there. You can feel it. And it literally is like that. Einstein did super interesting work back in um, when he was still alive and his early work working on how we emit photons. And basically every thought that we have in our head is gener- is a real physical structural change and generating an energetic force. So if someone doesn't like you and they have a because that generally is because there's something about themselves that you remind them of that is a gap in their own identity or something that's going to be a toxic thought that they've wired into their mind and even on an unconscious level they may not even be fully aware of all the all the details of it but it's alive and living and as they're in your presence or you in their presence then that becomes activated in the brain by the mind and then the mind-brain connection brings this thing to sort of into the light like shining a spotlight on it and then it starts generating the thoughts the physical structural proteins so i've had situations where my inner voice or whatever that feeling is you're describing which is really my photons apparently uh, my inner voice was screaming okay get away from this mean person maybe step you know step away get them out of my life but i couldn't because of whether it's logistics or involvement that we had in something but how does one emotionally handle that inner strife whether it is an intuition or those those photons that are really impacting us how does one handle that so we've got to realize that that communication is as real as what we are describing now it's electromagnetic light forces it's quantum energy it's it's gravitational fields um, it's and also all the words all the thoughts that that person has towards you and you towards them because it's always a mutual thing they, you know, I'm not saying that 
when one person is maybe unintentionally not trying to be unkind, but they bat, they back in with their own stuff, as I said, or they have translated that into pure jealousy and envy or whatever it may be, and you may just be an innocent bystander in the process, which however it works, it is a, an actual physical thing that is happening. And because you can't put a finger on it, as you were saying, it feels so strange. So what we need to do is recognize that we've got to watch it. We don't become a shock absorber, where we absorb all of this into us, into us, and then we build a toxic structure in our brain made of proteins that are all misformed, in, and that actually increases then this, this connection with the other person. So let me explain it like this and then I explain exactly how we block it think of it as there's two people and the person let's say that let's take one person who is now has a self-esteem issue and there's something about you that is affecting their global self-worth it's not your fault it's something in them but there's something about you that just triggers this in them and it's got nothing to do with you personally or maybe it has but it's mm-hmm. got a lot to do with what's going on in their past and they might it may not even be aware so this is a whole bunch of thoughts that are wired into the brain generating these energy forces and the whole nonverbal stuff and everything we've said. So you here now in the room with them or you're working with them or something like that and you can't get away from them and you feel all of this like weird stuff and it's all this electromagnetic and quantum physics stuff and it's coming in at you but because as humans we naturally are wanting to reach out and connect and be friends, we're very vulnerable in a good sense. Um, be vulnerable and because we automatically want to believe the best in people and yes I know we can become hardened and all that stuff but generally that is our nature as humans the first thing that I, I would recommend and this is something I would do with my patients and things as well is to understand the science as far as you can even if you just listen to what I've said now and then imagine that you have a this is a really simple technique but it is so powerful um, imagine that you have a shield of armor around you. So as you're in that person's company, imagine that that shield is around you. That's the first thing. So as you do that, there's a very interesting mind-brain-body connection thing that happens. As you imagine the shield, you physically build a shield, but it's a shield of energy. So therefore, what that person is saying and doing starts, instead of, instead of you absorbing it like a shock absorber, you actually reflect it. So you, it's in other words, you, you get stronger. You don't decrease your resilience because anything that comes in that's toxic is going to decrease your resilience. So imagine a, a dart bouncing off you. Mm. The second thing is to look at that person and you don't have to physically look. You can look away. But in your mind's eye, I don't mean you have to make deep eye contact, but see that person as how they're showing up is not who they really are. How they're showing up is because of something. It doesn't excuse their behavior. It doesn't mean you have to get the, get the brunt of their negativity. It doesn't mean that or that you have to feel guilty or just take it. It just means that you become more compassionate and empathic. That's and great. That I... enables you to be stronger. The third thing is you need to create a mental space. And the mental space is where you may have to, where you, if you can physically move away, you physically move away. But if you're sitting in a meeting and, and you can't avoid this person because you work with them, then your mental space is that you physically imagine like a third layer around you, which is imagine yourself inside a huge, big, um, a, a giant glass. This is such a funny imagery, but it works so well. Imagine being inside a huge, enormous glass and you sitting in the middle there and that person is on the outside of the glass. When you first walked in the room, there was no glass at all protecting you. There was no like little bubble of protection around you. Then as you started putting the shield up, a little bit of a bubble started all glass sort of protecting you, but it was a tiny little glass. So you kind of squished in and it was not very, it was very flimsy. So it wasn't working so well. But as you keep working on the defense of imagining the shield and imagining that the person is um, is um, has got the, you know, seeing them for their own issues, that that's not who they are, they, you know, the whole empathy thing. The glass is getting stronger and stronger and you're getting more and more space around you. So the glass transitions to a slightly bigger one and you've got more space around you and then eventually you're in this big glass. So you're, honey, I shrunk the kids tiny, but you're in this big glass. <laughs> I and love that. Put, That's such a great image to have. It, and that way it, we sort of eliminate it, that. Exactly. Yeah, that sort of that feeling of those. Sometimes, I mean, I feel like when you're dealing with a toxic person or a mean person in the workplace or in life, sometimes physically, physiologically, things can happen like our heart races. You know, we get a pit in our stomach. We feel that sense of dread. Oh, great, here comes that person again. And then we start sort of bringing on stress or worry or anxiety. 
But I, sometimes I feel like if we grew up and we were conditioned to worry or if we were in this anxious environment, that's sort of a cycle that I think we have to break. Don't you, do you think so? Like that stress can be a killer and it doesn't just like stop when you see somebody that's really stressing you out, but rather it gets worse if you don't really corral it and nip it early. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So absolutely, that's one of the fundamentals of 150 years of research around the mind brain body connection, such an established, and it's actually ancient research. It's not modern science is 150 odd years old. But what we know that's very established is that what we, how we react and respond and perceive situations influences the heart, the stress response, which actually is a great response. The stress response helps you to focus and activate your intelligence and so on. But when we, when we don't um, use the stress response, correctly there's certain red flags and we'll start tipping and we tip into a toxic response versus a stress response mm-hmm. so there's a point at which and, and the three steps that I'm describing that, that I just described will keep you in a positive stress response where the stress response will work for you where for example your blood vessels around your heart will dilate which increases the blood flow to your brain and oxygen to your brain that's just one of two of 1400 great things that will work for you but if you let yourself be affected by that person and and there's no guilt and shame here because you all have been but once we recognize this we can then sort of grab it and and protect ourselves as soon as you do that um you if, if you don't protect yourself um, your the blood vessels you'll shift into toxic stress, and then the blood vessels around your heart will constrict instead of dilate, and you'll have less oxygen and blood flow to your brain, and you know that's the heart palpitations, and that then st- triggers a 1,400 neurophysiological responses that will start putting you into a state of vulnerability. And it's not that you're going to have one bad encounter and be you know have a heart attack. It's it does accumulate over time. Mm-hmm. But if you so if you're constantly in that stressful environment, you know you can go for it for two years and sort of be coping and having periods where you have, you know, go home at night and over weekends you don't see that person or something. But then over it, but you've never really managed it or had a strategy in place. And if you come from a background of where uh, there hasn't been much of a, a, a sort of educational nurturing in your childhood of how to deal with stress, which is very very much the, the norm for a lot of people. Very few people really train their kids in how to deal with stress. It's kind of thinking, oh, well, kids don't feel it, but they do. Yeah, I'm it's... actually writing a book at the moment, Christy, on yeah. how to help your children with mental health. So this very, very thing that you mentioned about how we can almost be trained to be warriors or trained to fall into toxic stress just from our nurturing, totally unintentional by our parents, but it happens. Um, so if that, if, that is, if that whole setup is in the person, then what we're sitting with is um, a situation where, let's say two years down the line, you now have got this constant negative toxic reaction to stress and suddenly you start finding yourself losing your creativity or things that you used, used to cope with well, you don't do as well, or, but you feel fine and then you start doing something and it's not fine. You, you're just mm-hmm. not at that same level that you were at. Those are, and if that's becoming a pattern, that's a warning sign that that t- constant toxicity has actually created such a barrage that you've now started damaging your psyche and your physiology and so on. Ooh, so I really like looking for those warning signs like you're talking about. Yeah, that's such yeah. a critical piece. And the fact that you are able to teach kids stress, I feel like if we could teach our kids at a young age to really become more tolerant, become more understanding, become more introspective in terms of looking for stressors and managing them and really taking the time to to uh, to learn those life skills, I think we would be in such a better place. And to that point, I want to talk to you because we talk about that repeated sort of negative messaging, social media, mean words, people, uh, you know, the cowards behind them on social media. I feel like now we're in a place in society where there is that that onslaught of social media messaging. So what to do if someone is really trying to make you feel bad online, trying to bully you, bully your child, bully a family member online, how do you address it? Do you just let it go? Do you start to put that shield up again? But do you say something to them via social media back to them? Or what do you do? All these things that you as a human are exposed to in each person's own unique context is being encoded into the into the um, the brain as neural networks into the, every cell of the body as a change in your DNA and also into the network these gravitational fields of your mind. So 95 to 96, I actually think it's probably higher of how you function is driven by these non-conscious neuro neuro coding. 
um, that's the, these encoded patterns that you don't even control. So we're just non-consciously building the environment into us. And if we don't consciously self-regulate what's non-consciously driving us, in other words, look for the, the signals, the warning mm-hmm. signals that you that you picked up on, on in my previous statement, if we don't train ourselves as children, youngsters, children, adults, adolescents, whatever age we at, to tune in on a conscious level and self-regulate the signals that are in our life, that are coming from our non-conscious, we'll get driven. 95% of our day is going to be driven in this haphazard way by whatever we're looking at on social media and so on and so on. So that's the first thing. And it's not all hopeless. This is just how we are. It's how we have to function. Our unconscious mind operates 24-7. It's absolutely brilliantly phenomenal. We are brilliant. But what we're not taught enough about is how to read the signals from the non-conscious because the non-conscious will pick up, not only does it encode the environment, but it also scans to see what's bad for you and makes you aware through the subconscious mind into a conscious mind of, hey, listen, this anxiety you're feeling, this is not a mental illness. This is actually a warning signal telling you there's something that you coded in, probably non-consciously, that is not having a great effect on you. And so that could be that social media commenting and that could be that immersion into whatever. Because whatever you are focusing on, you're merging with in this non-conscious way. So we have to teach all of us, or every age group has to learn and we have to teach each other and help each other with this, especially our youngsters from young now, is to basically stand back and observe your own thinking, feeling and choosing through looking at the signals. So if you're feeling suicidal, if you're feeling like you have no global support, if you're feeling like you just can't cope anymore, you're feeling bullied, or you're feeling bad about yourself, that isn't actually what you should be feeling. So therefore, no guilt, no condemnation. There's a reason. There's always a reason. Especially as kids, we just are, I, I think we're at a point there when we're younger where we just don't know what we don't know in terms of how we are processing things. Can we kind of shift from this processing and, and sort of decoding or encoding to more of a, okay, let's take some action. Can we actually walk away? Can we, what can we do? What can we say? And what tools can we actually physically use to uh, kind of move forward and get out of this negative uh, focus? basically editing the code. So if we see, so I'll start with the top, uh, link it into the previous question and give you a big picture and then dive into a bit of detail. But essentially, it's if you find that it is because you're spending so much time on social media, should you, your one of your previous questions which links to this was, should you answer the person back? Should you ignore it? What should you do? That's where you need to get perspective. It's kind of like the glass example I gave earlier. When you're looking at that negative media, ne- negative social media comment and it's affecting you and you just can't stop thinking about it, you're sitting squashed inside a little tiny shot glass. But as you stand back and give yourself mental space and stop looking at it as much and start saying things like, okay, let me build this little, this, this uh, medieval shield thing around you. Um, the, as, as I start cre- seeing myself moving into the bigger glass, as I do those little steps, as I start having empathy, that person attacking me, as I, as I pl- start applying those steps I spoke about in the beginning of, of this, um, when you started interviewing me, then I'm going to start getting perspective. And part of getting into the bigger glass and eventually into the big jar is also helping asking for other people to say, hey, listen, I definitely am, I'm just not feeling great. I'm really feeling anxious and I'm, I think it might be something like this. Can I talk to you about this? So it's talking to, reaching out to someone else to get some perspective. Um, and that could be a loved one, a coach, a counselor, a therapist. Um, and then w- that kind of triggers the process of looking into the non-conscious. And I, and I want to stress here the non-conscious subconscious, conscious versus unconscious. The non-conscious operates 24-7. It's N-O-N conscious. Unconscious is used, a lot of people use that word, but it's actually not the correct term. Unconscious is when you're sleeping or when you're knocked out or you're under anesthetic. Non-conscious is an active thing where your mind is active, and but it's on a, on a level that we're not aware. Our mm-hmm. conscious mind is our mind active, but we're aware of it. The subconscious is the bridge between the two. And so essentially what we want to start doing is gathering awareness of what is coming from the non-conscious through the subconscious into our conscious mind. And that is a self-regulatory process. So to that end, Christiane, I know you're familiar with this because you've, you've spoken about this before when you've seen my work. 
I wanted to be able to help my patients with this on every level, whether it was on an academic level, corporate level, executive level, um, trauma level, dementia level, whatever they were dealing with, was how could I train someone to learn and develop the skill, including myself, I wanted to know myself too, mm-hmm. how to, we can learn to be to self-regulate in this way. How can we use the power of our conscious mind to tap into the power of, of our non-conscious mind to I think it's kind of nice to just be sort of blissfully unaware and and float through life without that because isn't that easier? We think so. We think it's easier initially, but it's the demons that we don't face that are busy destroying our neurophysiology. And those are the things that accumulate and come out, and it's all the little hidden stuff that we, we, that starts catching us, the burnout, the overwhelm, the little nagging physical illnesses, the constant nagging feeling of anxiety, that hovering, you know, sort of sadness. Now, something that I really believe in, and I don't have the scientific research as you have done for so many years, but I really believe in the power of releasing endorphins and what endorphins can do for us. Tell us more. I know you've done some research on, on laughter and things like that that really can shift that kind of that mindset if you're having a toxic relationship or a difficult time with someone how can we use endorphins to really improve those negative patterns and kind of shift that mindset to something a little bit more proactive well endorphins are just one of many chemicals but their specific function is to help pain relief stress relief and mental well-being is sort of three categories that they work in but they never work alone so the, there's a tendency in the current way sort of wellness movement to take a chemical like um, endorphins or dopamine or serotonin or whatever they always they never work alone they always work in un- unison with other with other chemicals and electromagnetic things and all the neurophysiologies everything's always very interconnected mm-hmm. so what happens then is that when we are um, starting to face our stuff or starting to deal with stuff or building these shields like I've been describing anything where you are constructively self-regulating all the things I've been saying and that you and I've been discussing the minute you do that you will get a neurophysiological response of which endorphins is part of that response and you will start increasing your feeling of empowerment as you manage things so even if it's painful even if like I've had patients saying oh my gosh I feel worse now than when I started it was better <laughs> hiding exactly like the comment you made earlier but it's different the pain that they, then they'll say but the depression or anxiety that I'm feeling now is different it's shifted from being a helpless controlled feeling to a hopeful grief right because you're taking action and you're uncovering and unburying exactly Mm -hmm. and you also you you get to the point of acceptance where you can find a cause but that's kind of where it ends because you're never going to understand why would someone do that to you for example someone who's a victim of abuse or something if we look for the reasons why we'll, we'll get stuck what we, what we need to do is just understand, okay, that's probably why I'm like functioning like this in my relationships or whatever, or why that person potentially, whatever, whatever, mm-hmm. why you, you know, how are we showing up? But the reason, you must be careful of getting why would that person, you can never understand someone else. And that was, that's really key in, in moving forward. Um, so basically any of this kind of stuff that we're talking about, when you do the five steps of the neurocycle, of which I only describe one, but there's obviously a whole process that you go through that helps you deconstruct and reconstruct these thoughts. And you can't change your story, but you can change what's happened to you. All that kind of thing, all this mind management stuff, all this putting up shields, etc., immediately will have neurophysiological effects of which endorphins are one. Endorphins work very closely. As soon as they start being released, you're going to get more serotonin, more, more dopamine, another thing called anandamide which is a bliss called the bliss hormone in other words a beautiful cycle gets set up that increases resilience whenever these hormones flow these neural hormones flow in a or neurochemicals flow in a certain pattern in response to a uh, any kind of level of self-regulation even if you're feeling worse there is a um, there's there's a resilience factor that that changes that shifts you become more resilient and so this is where our neurophysiology um, is guided by our mind. The pattern of our brain and our body follows the pattern of our mind. And when I'm managing, self-regulating, etc., when I'm into mind management, whatever it looks like, whatever you're dealing with, you then 
release things like, as I said, endorphins, which increase your resilience factor inside your brain and your body. And then a whole bunch of stuff happens. What about your personal journey? And why did you get involved in neuroscience in the first place? And how did you sustain a 40-year career in this? Has there been some adversity or a challenge that you've faced and you've said, okay, this is, this is my place and I'm going to stay in this space? For sure. I think one of the biggest things is sexism. You know, there's been quite a lot of, of that in my career. I've had scientists, you know, males sort of thinking, I've had males come up to me at conferences and say, well, why are you talking about this? It should be me kind of thing. So I've had that. Oh. But they, yeah, it's quite interesting. It sounds like and another podcast topic. Yeah, it is. It's great. <laughs> I, tell you this, I can tell you some really funny stories there. Um, it, I was driven from very young. So personal stories from very young. I was going to become a neurosurgeon. Then I thought psychiatry. Then I thought, no, psychiatry doesn't even deal with the mind. It's just, you know, it's just, I don't want to just deal with drugs, etc. cetera. Um, and I ended up doing a very, I was very fortunate to get a chance to do a degree in South Africa that was actually an experimental degree where they mixed uh, medicine with, with communication pathology, linguistic linguistics, neurology, um, psychology, um, it was phenomenal. Phenomenal in many ways because I was exposed to multiple fields in a very integrated way. Very, very, very demanding because it was a seven-year degree that they pushed into four years. We worked seven days a week in hospitals, in clinic, in lectures. And, and I remember at the time saying, I will tell my children never to do this degree and um, because it was so hard. But if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have done what, I'd done what I've done now. It opened my mind. They don't even have that degree anymore. They're only, only 60 of us qualified. It just because it was just, it was crazy. It was just not. You know, now they've kind of, in a way I'm sad, I think they should still have it, mm-hmm. just done it a little bit differently. But the point is that back in that time, in the 80s when I was studying, um, it was very radical, the thinking in this degree that I was doing. And um, it was, we were, because the brain at that point, they didn't believe the brain could change. So I challenged that early on, um, thinking, well, but we are changing as humans. How can the brain not change? Because the brain is the organ that the mind uses. And I remember asking one of my neurology professors, and they said, okay, well, that's a ridiculous question. I've actually done a TED talk on this. And um, he said, go do research. And I said, well, what area? And I said, he said, well, go to do traumatic brain injury. No, brains don't heal. So you'll you'll soon find out that you can't change the brain. So I did, and I, and I proved him wrong. And I showed, I did some of the first neuroplasticity research in my field where I showed that if you do this mind management stuff, even if you've had a traumatic brain injury, you can actually improve your cognitive, social, and emotional functioning. And that really triggered my research. I grew up in South Africa, born in Zimbabwe, and I grew up during the apartheid era. And I very early on, you know, we were activists and that kind of thing and became very aware that this was not the way to go. And I got involved in doing a lot of research, going into the areas that had been so underprivileged and doing, um, working in, I'd go to, I'd go to communities and I'd go to a school and a thousand people, 5,000 people would turn up and, and I'd have to talk to all these people about, you know, they, I, we didn't have a microphone or anything, but I don't know how they heard me, but we would, I would do it's hours and hour long teaching sessions on how your brain works and your mind and how to learn and how to manage emotions. And I could go anywhere pregnant on my own as a woman in places where you would just get murdered if you were white because I was bringing a message of hope. And it's nothing, it was just, mm-hmm. this is what I was consumed with. I can tell you a million stories in that field and that, in, in that time and that just got me going and I spent 25 years doing that and as well as doing, I did formal research and I did that for 25 years because I just wanted to understand the human mind and how we can change and I was at the same time working with very privileged people that could afford therapy and executives of companies so I've seen both ends of the spectrum mm-hmm, working sure in places have. like Rwanda where there was a genocide you know so I was very fortunate in my in my career and very honored to work with in the thousands of unbelievable people and see the resilience of the human spirit. And that really spurred me on. And so the last 15 years, I have translated all of that experience and initial research into very formal research where I now do clinical trials. We've got like another three running at the moment where I'm taking all these concepts and refining them to try and find ways of putting into people's hands the understanding of how we can, how we affected by life how we can't forget about the social impact and the nurturing and the whole environmental impact, but that we also, you know, you can't change people's stories, but in order to cope within while we change what's happening out there, um, we have to know how to cope with ourselves. 
so it gets to get strong enough to have the wisdom to be able to stand up and fight what's wrong, et cetera, et cetera, and not be crushed under the system or within the system. So yeah, that's what's driven sure. me and what still drives me. You know, and, and you had so many significant life moments, as you just defined, that really helped you to make a difference early in your life. And it really, I can see that sort of snowball effect in your life. And I know there are listeners today who are really struggling to pull it all together, to deal with toxic people. Maybe they're coping and trying to survive or rather than thrive. Do you have a takeaway nugget for our listeners as it ties to our topic today of turning toxic relationships into healthy ones? I think that two little nuggets and the first is that you can't control the events and circumstances of your life but you can learn and I stress the the, the, um, position of learning to control how you respond and it doesn't mean that the toxic person or the environment is going to change but if you can learn to manage your response you can be stronger and get out of those situations and that may require help from others too and then the other thing is that your story is never going to be replaced you know whatever's happened to you has happened but it doesn't have to be the same as what's in you. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. And I think I've got a takeaway nugget here. I've got many, but uh, I think that one of them is it's okay to walk away when you get to a place that is unhealthy to get you to a place of healthy and also to really find out our own stories and to really let those stories and those learning moments that you've described propel us forward. Dr. Leaf, tell us how our listeners can find you. Tell us about your website, your products, and some of the amazing books that you've written that I own and uh, where where we can uh, see you on social media as well. Thanks for that, Christy. My website is drleaf.com, and you can get, I have lots of books on there. Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess is the latest one. I'm writing one for children at the moment, but there's lots of books. There. Think, Learn, Succeed, and um, there's also my NeuroCycle app, so I, my whole system of the five steps and decompression activities and how to just cope with life from the big traumas to the little day-to-day stuff is um, clearly laid out in my books, but in my app called NeuroCycle, I literally walk you through it as though you're having therapy, and we're constantly upgrading and adding new stuff to it. So that's a great resource too, available on iTunes and Google Play. And then also you can find that on my website. My social media handles are Dr. Caroline Leaf. I'm on all of the standard ones, including TikTok. I've just got onto TikTok, which is a very a great platform for getting like little nuggets that can really guide one. And then I have a podcast called Cleaning Up the Mental Mess, which um, helps people with mental health and all these things you've been talking about. Just like your new book, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. Exactly. And Dr. Thanks. Caroline Thanks. Leaf, thank you for sharing your most significant and poignant research with all of us and for letting us know that we can remove ourselves from toxic relationships and find that place of peace and healthiness. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Find success by your own definition at your intersection of business and life on my next podcast, Business Life 360 After Hours. Thanks for joining us. I'm Christy Kay. Business Life 360 After Hours is hosted and produced by Christy Kay. Audio engineering production and editing by Chris Pfeiffer. Be sure to join Christy for her award-winning television series, Business Life 360, the third Thursday of the month on WGTE HD or at WGTE.org slash B360. Business Life 360 After Hours is a production of WGTE Public Media.